an honor to be invited to be with you, and I appreciate so much the invitation. The title of the discussion this evening is Hezekiah, the Churchill of Judah. And I want to introduce this by reading a section out of a narrative. With impunity in 1938 and 1939, Germany intimidated and devoured Eastern and Western Europe. War officially broke out in September 1939, and the nations of Europe fell like dominoes to the German juggernaut. Britain soon found herself alone in the European theater. Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of Britain in May of 1940, and in July, on July 10 of 1940, Hitler's Luftwaffe began its brutal air assaults of Britain. Britain stood alone against the Nazi regime until the United States entered the war on December 7, 1941. Within this context, on October 29, 1941, just a few weeks before the United States entered the war, Winston Churchill visited his private education alma mater, the Harrow School, and he went there to listen to the songs for which the Harrow School was famous and to serve as a point of solace for him. Within the se that setting, and his visit to, to Harrow School, Churchill delivered this famous speech, part of which I refer to. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. In nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. If you study much about the history of World War II, it is amazing that England was able to hold out as long as they did. But to a large extent, I think that has to be attributed to, the, to Churchill himself, and certainly the resolve of the British people. And I don't think it's an overstatement here to describe Hezekiah as the Churchill of Judah, because Hezekiah was facing a similar kind of juggernaut of military might that everybody had fallen to. And Judah alone was standing. And it's the resolve of Hezekiah that serves as the catalyst around which then Judah survives this military might machine of the ancient world. But before we proceed any further, I need, I want to sort of lay some groundwork here of methodology. One of the things that happens in a, with a historical event, so many historical events, there's nothing narrated about it. I mean, it happens and that's the end of it. Uh, unless somebody records it in some fashion, most of what happens in human history has never been preserved. I mean, just the volume, probably a, a minuscule percentage of all that has happened in human history has ever been preserved in any kind of way. And hence, there is a limited database from which to operate. Now, when it comes to the biblical world, one of the things we look for is, does the Bible have anything to say about this historical event? Well, in all honesty, most of the events in the Old Testament period and the New Testament period, the Bible does not address. The Bible has an agenda of its own. I'm not suggesting it is unhistorical. I'm not suggesting at all that it's inaccurate. But it's designed for a purpose, as is any good piece of literature. There's a purpose for which it is intended. And the Bible intersects that historical world with sort of a limited point of contact. Or then there is another avenue that we can look at is archaeology. Now the problem with archaeology is it also is a very skewed database. One of the really thrilling reasons why the discovery of Tutankhamun was so fantastic was because everything there was preserved. But it's because of the dry environment and the fact that no one had ever found it and everything was intact. But if it weren't for that dry environment, most of the goods in there would have deteriorated and rotted away and hence the need for conservation in museums. Where did she go? Anyway, uh, in museums and other kinds of settings, it's very important to have uh, humidity control, temperature control, and so forth and so on. Most of you are familiar probably with the Iceman that was discovered in the Alps. And this is one of those incredible discoveries which should not have occurred, but because of his preservation in that glacier, we are able then to study his remains, the skin's intact, tattoos show up, even the food that he ate was still preserved inside his stomach and they were able to analyze all of that. But under normal circumstance, all of that would be gone. 
So archaeology, by definition, tends to have a very limited range that it can bring to bear. If we were to think in terms of this building, I don't know what this building is made out of, but it probably has a good bit of wood in it. But if we were suddenly just to walk out of this building and let uh, abandon it, after a period of time, it would deteriorate to a point where most of the stuff that is here would be totally gone. So this is the limited database that archaeology brings to the discipline. Then there are those areas that are known as art history, where someone saw something in the ancient world, or even in the modern world, and writes or draws a picture of it. One of the fascinations of the caves in France that are so well known from prehistoric times is going in there seeing the drawings of the animals and so forth. And then the lurking question is, what does it mean? Because there is no description as to what they were thinking when they were drawing these things. Therefore, we're sort of left trying to figure all of this out, but nonetheless, it still bears upon some historical event, and we infer that it refers to some of the activities and, and things that the people of that time period were able to see. And then there are inscriptions. Inscriptions, of course, are valuable because they give us some insight into what people are thinking, whether it's monumental inscription, which is the official stance, or whether it's the graffiti, which is the reflection of somebody's mindset, whether a, re a rebel or a conformist, but somebody's written something on a wall or some other location, at least it's expressing something that someone thinks. And so these inscriptions become very important elements in our reconstruction of ancient history, or even modern history. Well, what's interesting about this episode that we're talking about tonight is that all four of these impinge on it. And we're going to look in turn at each of these, at some of each of these elements as they impinge on the historical event. And many scholars are of the persuasion, and I tend to agree with them, at least as far as I've studied all of this stuff, this one event has more avenues of testimony lending to our clarity of what's going on than any other event narrated in the pages of the Bible. And there's still much more that can be said, but I'm not, just not going to have time, so I won't drone on and on so that you, know, you can go to the museum after this is over. Anyway, so with this sort of in mind, I want us to move into our discussion. Assyria was a brutal empire, and cruelty seems to characterize so many places in the world, and always has, especially uh, an army that wants to take over other peoples. This is the core area that characterized ancient Assyria. Now, if you know anything about geography issues and so forth, this is what would be called a landlocked kingdom. Uh, it's exposed on all sides, uh, and hence vulnerable to attack from all directions. Babylon, on the other hand, which would be down here, doesn't have to worry about anybody really attacking it from what we now call Saudi Arabia, because functionally nobody lived out there then. And certainly there wasn't any military might to speak of. Or the Persian Gulf, which is over here on the lower right. People didn't do much sailing in the ancient world, certainly not warships in the sense that eventually the Greeks and the Romans are going to do. And hence the, the sailing element was not something that they had to fear too much in regards to invasion. So Babylon was basically only exposed from this direction, but Assyria, all sides. And they would be attacked by the Urartians, by the Hittites, by the Syrians, by the Babylonians, and from all directions. But in the middle of or early part of the 9th century BC, a king comes to the throne by the name of Asher, Asher Natsarpal. You don't have to worry about remembering how to spell that. You're not my students. <laughs> and so, well, Joel, I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> Anyway, Asher Natsir Paul comes to the throne, and one of the things that he begins is a campaign, a systematic campaign of preemptive strikes, where they will militarily attack the neighbors before the neighbors have a chance to muster a force and attack them. Now, on a certain level, this is not particularly surprising. I mean, this, this is certainly understandable from the standpoint of military politics. But what makes his strategy different is he begins to incorporate into his military strategy a campaign of deliberate terror to terrify his neighbors into submission. Basically, if you don't surrender, we are going to brutalize you. Now, during World War II, uh, reports would leak out from the occupied territories of the Germans that the Nazis were involved in some really horrendous kinds of things, but these were these were not official reports. They were, they were reports that people would deliver, and there was a tendency on the part of Britain and, and America not really to believe this. You know, surely what we're hearing cannot be legitimate, but it wasn't until the end of the war, at the end of the liberation of Dachau and Treblinka and Auschwitz, that we recoiled in horror at 
the awful things that the Germans, the Nazis, had done to so many subjects. Well, the point that I'm getting at here is that the Nazis had a tendency somewhat to suppress their cruelty. The Assyrians broadcast it. They used it as a means to try to scare their enemy into surrender and submission. And to give you some examples, here are some cuneiform documents in translation. Ashurnazer Paul here speaks, I approached the fortified city of Goliath. With the mass of my troops and my fierce battle, I besieged and conquered the city. I felled with the sword 800 of their combat troops. I burnt 3,000 captives from them. I did not leave one of them alive as a hostage. I captured alive Uliah, their city ruler. I made a pile of their corpses. I burnt their adolescent boys and girls. I flayed Uliah, their city ruler, and draped his skin over the wall of the city, Dom de Musa. I raised, destroyed, and burnt the city. Now, this is a pretty brutal description. Now, it's a written document. Now, admittedly, one might say, well, being a written document in the ancient world, most people could read, and certainly most people would have trouble reading Cuneiform or Arcadian. Uh, certainly would be a difficulty, but bear with me for a moment. But he goes on to another place. I approached the city of Telem. I fell 3,000 of their fighting men with a sword. I carried off captives from them. I captured many troops alive. I cut off of some their arms and hands. I cut off of others their noses, ears, and extremities. I gouged out the eyes of many troops, and I made one pile of the living and one of heads. I really don't know what that means, but it sounds not good. I hung their heads on trees around the city, and I burnt their adolescent boys and girls. Now notice the, the drama of this description. Now, it sounds like you don't like teenagers. I realize teenagers can sometimes get under your skin, but that's not the issue here. The issue is the, the horrifying reality and demoralization of a parent watching and seeing their children killed before their eyes. And that's what these Syrians are doing. It is to deflate the morale of anybody that is there. And they would broadcast this. Now some of the broadcast is in the form of, in, uh, of artwork. This is from the University of Chicago Oriental Institute Museum and it's some of Asher Natsipal's release from his palace. Uh, and as you look at this, you can see uh, the soldiers walking along, but you look carefully, they're trampling over the bodies of those who are deceased. But if you look more carefully, they're carrying the heads in their hands of those whom they've decapitated. ISIS. I mean, this is sort of the ISIS kind of stuff that we hear about. And by the way, the ISIS folks are buying into exactly the same kind of mindset and tactic of intimidation and terror. And that's one reason why they'll broadcast some of the hideous things that they do. And to a certain extent, it, it is affected. The buffer that we have in the United States from that at this point is we're so far removed from it geographically. And, but this is the mindset. And Asher Natsipal is preserving this in some artwork. Now, that's not the kind I would want in my living room. But nonetheless, this is how he operates. But moving ahead, Ashurbanipal, another king who lives around 660 B.C. in the 7th century, about 200 years later than Ashurbanipal. These are different people, even though at first they sound the same. Most of you have probably seen this relief. It often appears in art history classes. Uh, I don't know if York has a requirement for art history or music or preach or something like that, but if you have an art history class, this likely will come up in the course somewhere. And it might come up in a Bible class, particularly Old Testament. And this is sort of a serene scene. As you look at it, it looks calm. Everything's good. Everything's comfortable. Uh, the king is lying there on his couch. The queen is sitting on a chair or a throne in front of him. They're drinking from their cups. There is a brush arbor over them. Behind them are the fan bearers keeping them cool. I mean, what more could you want than a nifty afternoon and a breeze enjoying a, a nice little drink out in the garden? But there's more to this relief than this. This is the part that is sort of calm and serene. There's the rest of the picture. And as you look at the rest of the picture, you'll notice over here on the left-hand side the head of a king, the king of Elam, hanging in a tree. Now, if you remember the reading that we read a moment ago about Asher Paul, one of the things he mentioned was hanging the heads of people in the trees. Well, they're still doing it, apparently, 200 years later. And this changes the whole drama of this scene. Now, it's a victory ceremony of his over the king of Elam. There's another interesting element. If you look on that table over there, there is a bow that is put on the table. The war is over because he's been victorious. 
Well, it's this kind of mindset that Hezekiah is going to be confronting. And why would he have the resolve to stand in opposition to it? Well, as we look through the pages of Scripture, we see that Hezekiah implements a number of defensive measures to try to prepare Judah for the arrival of this very systematic military machine. Now, you have to remember, the northern kingdom of Israel has already fallen about 20 years earlier. And many of the people up in Israel, the kingdom of Israel, have fled as refugees to the south and have swelled the population of Jerusalem. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And so you can be sure that they would have brought reports with them because the Assyrians besieged the city of Samaria three years. And they would have tried to put it to the sword and brutalize everybody as best they could to try to get them finally to surrender. In the face of that, Hezekiah implements a number of defensive measures. Among them are religious reforms. Now, I don't, don't want to imply that Hezekiah is only involved in religious reforms as a, an opportunistic approach. I firmly believe that Hezekiah is a man of deep faith who believes in the Lord, who trusts the Lord, and also recognizes that one of the reasons these things have happened to Israel and Judah is because the, the people of God have abandoned their faithful worship to God as God had prescribed. If you look through the pages of the Bible, particularly in, in the kings and sometimes in the prophets, it will talk about worshiping on every high hill and under every great tree. It will talk about the high places that the kings will multiply for, uh, from place to place. And God had made specific provision in Deuteronomy, you shall not multiply these places of false worship to the contrary to the place that I caused my name to dwell, namely Jerusalem. That's where you're supposed to bring your offerings and your sacrifices. So they've abandoned the Lord. Now they may be worshiping Him along with, and we do have evidence of some of that, but they've abandoned the proper worship of the Lord. And Hezekiah understands that the problems that have arisen among us in part have come about as a result of our unfaithfulness to God. So he wants to try to reform that. And the Bible commends him highly in 2 Kings for that. A second thing that he does is stockpile food. The Assyrians are very adept at warfare. They know what they're doing and they know how to do it. They were the professionals of the ancient world. With all due respect to uh, Mr. Standback, it would be an interesting war to see the Assyrians fight the Romans. Uh, I, I don't know what the outcome of that would be, but the Romans were also very effective, and as were the Assyrians. But you, you have to understand, they're different eras, of course. But with the Assyrians coming and the potential of a siege, Hezekiah wants to make sure we have enough foodstuffs on hand. And the Bible will talk about this. Now, it doesn't at first sound like he's talking about stockpiling food in anticipation of the Assyrians. But if you look at the larger context, he's not oblivious to the potentiality issues that could unfold. A third thing that he does is strengthen the fortifications and stockpile weapons. You've got to be able to fight. You've got to be able to defend yourself. And so he's going to implement some defensive measures, particularly in Jerusalem. Uh, in order to protect the population. And the last thing that he does is secure the water supply, particularly in Jerusalem, but we also have evidence that he did so at uh, Beersheba as well. Now, we can look at each of these things in turn archaeologically, and I want us to do that. But before we do that, I want us to set a scene of how this unfolds. I realize this is not a Bible class, so I'm not expecting you to have brought a Bible, but many of you might have it on your app or whatever. I don't have Bibles. I'm, I'm old-fashioned. I'm an archaeologist after all. <laughs> but I want to read a section out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 36. And read along, and I'm going to make some comments. So this is a little bit tedious, but bear with me. Because the setting is extremely important within the framework within which Hezekiah is operating. Now this is set up in the first part of the chapter. The king Sennacherib is at the site of Lahish, which is southwest of Jerusalem. He's besieging the city. Most of these kings recognize, I really don't want to have to take the army to a town to beat them up. Okay, so if I can scare them into surrender, then I've saved myself a lot of work. Maybe the soldiers can go home quicker. Uh, a better, you know, morale among the, the Syrian army and so forth. So he sends an entourage to Jerusalem to try to persuade Hezekiah to surrender. Now that entourage arrives outside of the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Now, please remember that there's been a swelled population of refugees come down from the north. And surely they've told the people of Judah what the Assyrians were up to and how they behaved. So what you can imagine here, and it's not just an imagination, but the text gives us indication of this, 
The entourage arrives, and they're outside of the walls of the New Jerusalem. Hezekiah sends an entourage out to talk to them. But the people are up on the wall, straining their ears to hear this conversation because their lives are in the balance. And they're wanting to know how, what the outcome of this discussion is going to be. So we pick up the read in verse 4. And the Rabshakeh, which is a reference to the field commander, the NIV renders the idea more effectively. And the Rabshakeh said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria. And I want you to remember that phrase because that's going to come back in significantly. On what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you're trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it? Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. Now, he's sort of anticipating the prospect that the people of Judah will seek a military alliance with Egypt. But, you know, typical kind of political bombast, he's going to belittle the strength of the Egyptians and say they're, they'll be worthless for you, which has been pushed up to show they were. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Now this indicates that they have a bit of an intelligence network. They know what Hezekiah has done in removing the high places, the competing places of worship, at least as best as Hezekiah would be able to do so. But the Assyrians are looking at as an insult to the Lord God of Israel rather than faithfulness to him. So it's sort of reversed, but nonetheless, the rhetoric remains. Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to set riders on them. Now, I refer to this as the Assyrian Blue Light Special. <laughs> Where basically he's asking, you know, first 2,000 to come out the city gate. I'll give you a horse. I'll let you survive. He will later po point out that you'll be living somewhere else, but at least you'll be alive. <laughs> now, the population of J Jerusalem at this point probably was somewhere in the realm of 15,000 or so. And if suddenly 2,000 folks were to leave, that would be rather demoralizing to the people left behind. Oh, there goes Aunt Susie. What am I going to do? And there's Uncle Gilbert. He's off, you know, those are not typical Hebrew names, but anyway. <laughs> How then you can repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Moreover, is it without the Lord God that I have come up against this land and destroy it? The Lord, Yahweh, said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Now that raises an interesting question. Is this an accurate statement or not? Now, admittedly, it's political bombast. But did the Lord tell the Assyrians verbally, go attack Judah? Now, Isaiah will point out in chapter 10 that Assyria is his rod of anger in his hands, that he's using the Assyrians as punitive strategies. So at least the people of Judah would be aware of the fact that God can be operating using the Assyrians. Now, whether God overtly told and explicitly told Assyria to come or not is open to question. But as far as the people of Judah are concerned, yes, God did. At this juncture, Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah intervene. They don't like listening to all of this as, please speak to your servant in Aramaic, for we understand it, and do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. That's one reason we know it's within that earshot. The rapture said to them, Has my master sent me not to speak these words to your master and to you alone, and not to the men sitting on the wall who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? Pretty grisly description. But in times of siege, people will resort to extreme measures to try to survive. Then the rapture stood and called in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Now we skip down to verse 18. Beware lest Hezekiah mislead you by saying the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Now this is sometimes referred to as the weight of history. But the weight of history is not always proof. And he continues, where are the gods of Hamat and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? And the implication here is, were those gods sufficiently strong to ward off Assyria? Of course, the answer is no. 
have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? And of course, this hits close to home because the Samarians were the neighbors and kinfolk to the north. Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their lands out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? I mean, this is a powerful speech. And it's one that I'm sure weighed heavily upon those who heard it. Now, putting that in context, we're going to move on. I'll come back to this speech and look at it a little bit differently in a moment. I mentioned at the beginning of the chapter that Sennacherib is at the site of Lachish. Here's an aerial view of the site of Lachish. This is the siege ramp down here that the Assyrians built. It doesn't show up real well. But the Assyrians built in order to uh, bring the siege machines up to the wall and batter the walls down. Now, this does not look particularly intimidating until you look at it from down below. And as you're looking at it from here, walking in the valley below, look at the rise that is there, and then it's surmounted by walls that would be 25, 30 feet high. And imagine being an Assyrian soldier, clamoring up this and trying to, you know, beat on that wall and break it down, but it's, you know, it's a massive wall and, you know, the risk of death and everything else. I mean, this is formidable. This is a fortification that would be difficult to breach. And apparently Sennacherib thought so too. Because Sennacherib, after he conquers the city, which he will do, is going to go home and commemorate it in his palace, on his, in his palace on the walls. And uh, I'll chat about that a little bit differently here in a moment. He also brags about his campaign against Judah on this, this Akkadian record. There are two copies of these that are known. I think there are only two. One is in the uh, British Museum. The other is in the University of Chicago Oriental Institute Museum. And in both of them, they say essentially the same thing. And he talks about, Sennacherib talks about going to Judah, and he talks about and brags about having captured 46 fortified cities of Judah. Now, that's basically all of the fortified cities. It's interesting the Bible says he captured all the cities. It doesn't give a number, but you know, all 46, hey, that's going to cover the bases pretty well. So there's no conflict here. Now, he does talk about Hezekiah, but I'm going to put that on hold because that's an interesting insight that he uh, offers in the description. But Sennacherib apparently was quite pleased with the outcome of all of this. Now, he's going to commemorate this campaign against Lachish, in particular in his palace. This is the floor plan of the palace, and this part right here is slightly smaller than a football field to give you some idea of how big his palace is. This is the throne room. It's room 36. And by throne room, I don't mean the way teenagers will talk about the throne. All right. Uh, this is the throne room where the, the people will come in. I have an audience before the king and all this kind of thing. The room actually is not much larger than this room. But there would have been a door opening about where the whiteboard is. You would come in and the king's throne would be over here. So people would come down the series of hallways uh, that we have here and then make a right-hand turn to the audience of the king sitting over here. This was standard protocol. So, in this portrayal, what we have as we go into this are these kind of massive creatures that are intimidating. Now, I'm not the best of scale, but this will at least suffice relatively. These are not little, okay? And part of the idea is bigness, the, the grandeur of the king, and the king and you know, his power and his might. And that's not a, you know, even though it has a human face, that's not your, you know, pet cat kind of thing. Uh, intimidating, and that's part of the point. Now, as you go through this, here's an artist's rendering of, now this is actually is from Sargon's palace, but the same thing was in Sennacherib's. I don't have a picture of Sennacherib's itself. But he has the same kind of things. And you go down, first gateway, second gateway, third gateway, and you look very faintly, go all the way down there, there's, there's some drawing on the wall. Now, that drawing on the wall becomes the focal point that I want us to consider in the next couple of pictures. The first one is, and you have to remember that this is all, while it's monochrome here, even though it is black and white, the actual thing is monochrome, sort of a brown hue all over. But it originally was in color. It was painted. Now the colors are weird, but nonetheless, it's in color. And we know that because the reliefs, when they were discovered and are now the British Museum, still have in places the paint clinging to it. So we know that it was painted so the contrast would stand out more dramatically than this. But as you're looking at this, this fellow, these two fellows over here are being flayed. Remember the reading in Abashur Nights of Paul? These dudes are being flayed. This fellow over here seems to be suffering with a problem as the guy is sticking a knife into his upper shoulder. Uh, you know, carotid arteries are being cut and all those nifty things. And, you know, death is going to be fairly quick. This is a drawing of, of the picture above. 
Now what you have to realize, this is the wallpaper where the king receives representatives from other countries. So that when they come to visit, they see this, and they may not be able to read Akkadian, but they can look at pictures, and they've probably heard some reports, and they can go back and they can say, you know, when those Assyrians come knocking on our door, we better think twice before we resist them. But as you scan around a little bit further, there's another scene of these three guys being impaled. And they take a post about three inches in diameter or so, jam it underneath the rib cage, lift the person up to dangle and to death. Some will refer to this as crucifixion. Now, in the museum, there are some uh, reliefs that show this. And I highly recommend that you, if you haven't done so, go in and look at it. And uh, three panels that you have. I mean, this thing is huge. It would have covered the entire wall of the building. Uh, of the room, but three panels are represented in, in your all's museum, which I'm very jealous, by the way. But anyway, but I highly recommend that you have a look at it. And it, it's sobering to stand there and realize this is the city, this is the biblical city that's mentioned here in Isaiah chapter 36 that eventually fell. Now, we know why or where this is by looking at this inscription. And this portrayal, the panel is here, and the king is on the throne, and he's receiving some of the survivors, at least temporary survivors, of the city of Lachish who are being presented before him. Now, what's going to happen to them, I don't know. Are they going to be hauled off in captivity or executed? I, I don't know the answer to that. But nonetheless, they're being presented to the king. But there's an inscription up here that is written in Akkadian, and it translates to say, Sennacherib, king of the world, remember that phrase out of the reading? Thus says Sennacherib, king of the world. Well, he's still talking. He's talking that way here. Thus, uh, Sennacherib, king of the world, king of Assyria, sitting on his throne while the spoil from the city of Lachish passed before him. Now, this relief system shows all kinds of things, and it shows the the, the city there being battered to pieces uh, with the siege machines. The defenders are throwing firebrands down. The uh, Assyrians are shooting arrows and slinging stones up, and it's a real active kind of scene, and, and part of that is in the museum downstairs. But, everybody okay? It's just a table. Okay. <laughs> wow. For a second, it was a That'll make everybody up. Okay. Uh, but, uh, where was I? <laughs> but, but all of this is designed to intimidate. And the whole room is dedicated to this preservation. All right, let's look at some of the things that we may be seeing. I, I pointed out on that aerial photograph, the siege ramp. There's the siege ramp as it may be seen now. Now, you may think that that slope is awfully steep, and it is. But I'm sure that part of the steepness has increased because of erosion. Remember, this was built in 700 B.C. So it's had 2,700 years to erode. This also is cut away here because it's been excavated. The, the archaeologists have sectioned through it. But if you were to look at the slope here as compared with the slope of the tell, there's a significantly reduced angle that would make it somewhat easier to get the siege machine in place. Although I, I'm not at all going to suggest that would have been easy under any kind of circumstance. In the excavation of the siege ramp, the archaeologists found a number of really interesting artifacts. I will not show you all of them. But uh, among them were the sling stones. This, was, this is reconstructed. This is a modern creation. But these are some of the sling stones out of the rubble of that. Sling stones, we have a tendency to think of the David and Goliath story and think of the rock that he picked up about the size of a shooter marble. All of the evidence is that sling stones at minimum were the size of tennis balls. And they went up to about the size of softballs. And if you actually, again, go down, it, it, was it on that relief? If we look at the, the, the sling throwers are behind the archers. Yes. Uh, yeah. So if you stop and look at this, and why in the world are the sling throwers behind the archers? Well, that implies they have a greater range than the archers. So this is a formidable weapon that was used in both directions. In the excavations, they also found these iron and bronze arrowheads, and some made out of bone. I'll talk about the bones in a moment, but I've often wondered how many times did these arrows travel back and forth? You know, if the Assyrians shoot an arrow in, you're not just going to let it lay there as spent you know, weaponry. You're going to pick it up and shoot it back. So I've often wondered how many times they went back and forth. And then there are the bone ones. Why in the world are there bone ones? Well, probably the people in Lachish. You know, the animals die, they need weapons, and so they take the long bones of the cows and the sheep and the goats, turn them into arrowheads and attach them to shafts and shoot them off and everything else. 
I mean, the drama implied in just this little picture, if you stop and think about what all is involved, is very characteristic of this kind of warfare. And these are the people of Israel, the people of God, who are dealing with this. Now, another element that we consider are the storehouses. I talked about the storage and stockpiling of food and the stockpiling of weapons, well, as well as the religious reform. This is a photograph from the excavations at the site of Beersheba in southern Judah. And these are some storage buildings that are there. They're, they're about as long as about from where I am to the wall down there, not quite as wide as this, although there are three of them that are all lined up together. And when these were discovered, they were just filled with broken pottery, storage jars, bowls, and all that kind of stuff. And apparently, it was food that had been stored in the storehouse in anticipation of the arrival of the Assyrians, only to find that they're defeated. These are one of the 46 fortified cities that was destroyed by the Assyrians. But in the excavation, one of the things they found that was really fascinating were these stones in one of, at the end of one of those storage buildings. Now, if you look at this carefully, I realize this is not the best photographs, but it's the best I can, I, I can locate. And in this, you'll see the, the regular stones, but there are some that are very distinctly shaped, very finely shaped, squared off, but yet you also have some unusual shapes that are involved here. But otherwise, very straight line, very straight line. Uh, this one is very squared. This one is very squared. Uh, these are just sort of regular field stones. Well, all of these squared stones are not even native to the region. They've been brought in from somewhere else, which implies something special. The shape of them also implies something special. And when these were discovered, the archaeologists recognized what they had was actually a dismantled four-horned altar. And this is the altar in the, in the Israel Museum. And it's not huge. This is me. The reason I'm there is for scale. But this is the altar that was discovered, dismantled, and they had taken the stones of the altar and used it as building material to build the storage building. So you had the dovetailing of the religious reform, getting rid of the competing place of worship, in conjunction with the stockpiling of food. And as you look at this and think about, wow, this, this, this says volumes about what's going on in the pages of the Bible and what the people of Judah were attempting to do. Now, among those storage jars were jars that had stamps on the handles like this. Now, there are several different styles of these, but this, this impression up here says Lamelech Hebron. And the Lamelech means belonging to the king, and then the site of Hebron is mentioned. There are four different towns that are cited on these different uh, kinds of impressions. Here's a picture of what those storage jars look like. We have found a bunch of them now. This is what they look like now. These are not from Beersheba. These are from Bet Shemesh, where Frank and I and Kate, uh, Amber have excavated. Sorry, and Amber have excavated. Uh, although we've not really found full jars like this. This was all excavated before. Typically, we became associated with it. Although this last year, we found a number of those stamped handles. Uh, two, two or three of them. Was it? Anyway, two or three of them. But these are what the jars looked like. They stand about this tall, they're about this big around, and they were for holding wine and oil and grain and barley and so forth in anticipation of the arrival of the Assyrians. So we have corroboration of what Hezekiah does, not only at Beersheba, but also at, at Tel Bet Shemesh, and a host of other sites as well. These stamped handles have been found scattered typically around the perimeter of Judah. The, in the outskirts to try to ward the Assyrians away. Of course, it failed. It failed according both to the prism of Sennacherib as well as the biblical account. So, in Jerusalem, Hezekiah wants to protect his people. Now, this is a drawing of a map. This is the old city of David that David captures. It stops about right there, a very small little sliver on the spur of land down here. It expands northward to accommodate the area where the temple eventually is going to be uh, built. So the, the old city of Jerusalem, for the most part, was this long, skinny section on this spur of land. In the time of Hezekiah, it expands wildly out to the west, in part, at least, to accommodate the refugees that have come down from Samaria with the arrival of the Assyrians, but also other Judahites that might come into the capital city to find refuge as well. In 1967 A.D., whenever the Six-Day War occurred, and some of you will remember that. The Israelis took over uh, Jerusalem, the West Bank, the Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights. Now, this is all still a bone of contention all over the place. I'm not going to get into modern politics on this. But the Israelis come into each of these places very feverishly begin studying and excavating because they're afraid they're going to have to give it back. 
at some point, which they did the Sinai. Uh, haven't really given anything else back. Okay, but uh, but they weren't sure how all this was going to unfold. Of course, they still had control of the old city, as we think in terms of it. So in this excavation, one of the things that the archaeologists found was the remnant up here uh, of, well, this, this will show you where it is. At this location on this wall, this what is known as the Broad Wall. Now, the Broad Wall is called this in the book of Nehemiah. When Nehemiah comes back and he does that night survey around the ru ruins of the city, he comes and it talks about the Broad Wall. And actually, it's a little later the reference the Broad Wall occurs. It's only a geographic reference point because they don't rebuild this wall, but it's called Broad Wall because it's big. Now, the Israelites were not real keen on naming things creatively. They tended to name them sort of what they were. All right, so if they had a pet dog, they might name it Dog. Sort of like McClintock, if you ever watch the Jane and John Wayne movie. Yeah. Or if they had a pet cat, they name it Cat, if they have, you know, so forth and so on. So they name it what it is. They name this a Broad Wall because it's a big wall. <laughs> about 25 feet thick. I think that qualifies. Now to give you some perspective here, you may not be able to see this very well, it's sort of hard to locate, but there's basically a two liter red labeled Coke bottle in this thing, laying on the surface of it, uh, and it's right there. Now it doesn't show, the color doesn't show, but you can tell that the color of that is a little different than everything else if you look real carefully. But the fact that you can hardly see it is my point. Most of us know how big a two liter Coke bottle is. Actually, in Israel, they're one and a half later, twenty-eight, twenty-nine. Uh, most of us know how big they are, and you know it would stand out, red label and all that. Well, this one you can barely see. Now, another element that is fascinating. Notice this wall here, and then the big wall that rests on top of it. So you have that are, the lower one down there is like this, and then the big wall is resting over it, so that the the other one is sort of under it. Can you can you see that? There's a passage in Isaiah 22 where Isaiah talks about exactly this thing, not this, not necessarily this location, but he talks about you looked at the, the houses around town and you broke them down in order to build a fortification. And that's exactly what we have here. And this dates, according to the excavator, exactly to the time period involved. Now, God has ticked off the Israelites because they're placing their trust in the fortifications and not so much in God. Now, Hezekiah is different. Hezekiah is faith in God. But the people are sort of putting their trust in the armaments of God and through Isaiah is indicting them for that. Now, by the way, we're nearing the end in case you're wondering when's he ever going to end. Uh, so, now, the water supply is the last part I want to consider. And we're looking southward through the Kidron Valley. And you notice the steep slope that is here. The city of David is up here. The outside of the city is down there. The old city wall would have been about right there. And so this would be the interior of the city. This is the outside of the city. Now in the ancient world, in this part of the world, most of the time, usually the water supply is a spring at the foot of the hill. Usually. All right, and that is exactly what we have here. Gihon Spring is actually underneath that building that you can barely see on the left side of the photograph. And so it's outside of the city wall. And hence, it is vulnerable to enemy sabotage. Now, you might wonder, well, why didn't they just build a wall on the outside of that? Well, here's why. That's the building right there. And so you go down the slope, you hit the bottom of the valley, and you head up the other side. And if you were to build a wall outside of that high enough to be viable or anything, engineering-wise, it would be extremely difficult and extremely expensive. And so they built the wall up slope, and then they had to do something in order to secure the water supply. Now, Hezekiah is aware of the fact, I'm sure, although not specifically stated. Hezekiah is, I'm sure, aware of the fact that it was through the water system that David initially captured the city, 2 Samuel chapter 5, and doesn't want that replicated. Plus the fact that the water supply is outside of the old city wall here, means that it would be fairly easy pickings to shoot off the folks, you know, kill them as they come to get their water, or to throw a dead horse or whatever in it, to sabotage and poison the water supply. So you got to do something, and he wants to do something. So what he does is an engineering feat in and of itself. He proceeds then to authorize the digging of a tunnel from up here near the spring, at the spring, Econ Spring, and it's going to come down to the Pool of Siloam. 
Now you can faintly see the blue line running through here, and that's the path of there. Excuse me. That's the path of the tunnel. Now from the spring to the Siloam Sol pool is a drop of about 18 inches over a distance of almost 1,800 feet. Now that's a pretty impressive engineering feat in and of itself. One of the neat things is you can go through this, and it's great fun. If you get claustrophobic, it's awful. Um, because there are no lights in it other than your flashlight or whatever it is you're carrying, uh, and you hope you don't drop it into the water. So, but we're going to go. We're going to go through this. But here are a flight of steps going down where the water is going to begin flowing out from underneath the step right there. It's flowing toward us, toward where from where I'm taking this picture. As you go through this, this is about the width of the tunnel, the whole distance. It's not always this low. I like this picture because there are not many places in the world I have to dark. <laughs> so this is a special place for me because, you know, okay. But this is more like what it often is. So if you ever go through this, don't think you're going to have to duck all the time. But the tunnel rarely gets any wider than this. And one of the neat things about as you, as you enter in where the spring is flowing and you're, you're walking along with the flow of the water, and you look carefully at the wall, there are these chip marks on the wall on each side. And they're arced, they're curved. And as you stop and think about this, think about a, a worker having an adze in his hand, or her hand, his hand most likely, swinging this adze, chipping away at this limestone, and leaving these arced chip marks on the way. As you get toward the middle, although you don't necessarily know you're at the middle, as you get toward the middle of this, there's these sudden turns. At first, there's some long, gentle turns, and you really don't notice those because they're so gentle. But when you get toward the middle, it's a sudden right-hand turn, 90 degrees. And then you have another left-hand turn at almost 90 degrees. And another right-hand turn shortly. And then it zigzags back. And then you finally get to a point where it smooths out and it seems to be a long flowing tunnel. And you look at those arcs and they're coming back at you. And you can easily infer, well, they started out at opposite ends and they dug toward each other. Which is exactly what they did. And that's preserved in an inscription which is no longer there. It's now the Istanbul Museum, but this is the photograph and the inscription. And the translation, which it doesn't show up well, I'm sorry, it's very hard to read even in even looking at it. Uh, and you can faintly see some letters on there, I hope. But the translation reads, and while there were still three cubits to be cut through, there was heard the voice of a man calling to his fellow. And when the tunnel was driven through, the quarrymen hewed the rock, each man toward his fellow, axe against axe, and the water flowed from the spring toward the reservoir for 1,200 cubits. Makes it sound like, voila, we've done it. Immediately, everything works. Well, I, I suspect this is government grandiose declaration, and they had to do a little smoothing and everything else. But nonetheless, it did work. The water goes into what is known as the Pool of Siloam. This is the remnant of the Pool of Siloam, which is referred to in John 9, where Jesus, the disciples come to Jesus and they ask him a question. Who sinned? This is, this is a blind man. Who, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus says, for neither of these reasons, but that the power of God may be shown. And he makes this mud pack of spittle and clay and puts it on the guy's eyes and says, and this is basically the way the text reads. It will vary a little bit with your translation. But it says, go to wash in the pool of Siloam, which by interpretation means sin. All right. Most people, when they read that, think that Jesus is sending the guy to go wash in the pool of Siloam, which, of course, he is. But that's not what the interpretation means sin is referring to. It's referring to that's the name of the pool in the first place. It is sit pool. Sort of like the broad wall. Okay. The water is sent through a tunnel 1,800 feet long from the spring source to the <laughs> reservoir source, and so they call it sit pool. <laughs> so it, 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 that's why we're going to come back to that. Okay. So that, that's the coming back to it. But it's fascinating to be able to come into this and realize you're actually in a location that not only has significant <laughs> Old Testament significance, but also plays a significant role in the theology of the Gospel of John and in the power of God in both narratives. As I look at this narrative and, and think and how it unfolds, I mentioned the prism where Sennacherib boasts of capturing 46 fortified cities. Hezekiah is mentioned in that, but in an unusual way. 
but I have to read the rest of the story. The Rabshakeh, after this discussion outside of the walls of Jerusalem, goes back to rendezvous again with Sennacherib, who has finally captured Lachish, and he has moved on to Libna, which is not too far away, and now is being excavated by an archaeological crew. Apparently, Sennacherib isn't really gung-ho about taking the Assyrian army to, to Jerusalem. And so he sends a letter giving Hezekiah a second chance, hoping he'll surrender. Well, Hezekiah takes that letter, apparently in the form of a scroll, and in chapter 37 of Isaiah, beginning in verse 14, Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the Assyrians, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. Wow. Hezekiah's done everything he can. But he still holds faith in the Lord. God likes this. He likes it immeasurably. And God tells Isaiah to go back in. Verse 33, same chapter. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, or shoot an arrow there, or come before it with a shield, or cast up a siege map against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return, and he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend the city to save it for my own sake, and for the sake of my servant David. The Bible tells us then that the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 of the camp of the Assyrians. Snacker had waked up and said, we need to go home. <laughs> and so they leave. Now, he does commemorate his capture of the city of Lachish in the palace. In that prism that was the, 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 the octagonal one that I showed, what he says about Hezekiah after saying, I've captured 46 fortified cities of Judah, he says, and Hezekiah I shut up in Jerusalem like a bird in a cage. You probably heard this in Sunday school. But this is the setting of all of this. Now, stop and think about this for a moment. Remember how Ashurnatzer Paul, Sennacherib, Ashurbanipal, Paul, and essentially all the kings between would brag about how brutal and cruelly they treated anybody who resisted them? For him simply to say, I shut up Hezekiah in Jerusalem like a bird in a cage is a wild concession of I lost without making himself look bad. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. I don't even know if it's an accurate historical story. Some of the historian types can correct me and either affirm or help me deny. I'd rather it not be denied, but anyway, because it's a neat story. Um, my understanding was that sometime during the 1960s AD, uh, when the Soviet Union and the United States were really at odds with each other, okay, occasionally there would be some cultural event by which there was an attempt to try to you know, mend all of the tensions. And as I recall, there was a track meet that had taken place between the Soviet Union and the United States. Just a track meet. Nothing else. It wasn't Olympics or anything like that. And in this track meet, the United States won. Well, the report that I read was that the Soviet Union said there was a track meet between the United States. There was a track meet in which the United States and the Soviet Union participated. And the Soviet Union came in second. <laughs> and the United States came in next to last. <laughs> <laughs> now, whether that's actual actual story or not, it's sort of what's going on here with Hezekiah with, with Sennacherib. He doesn't really admit we messed up and we lost, but when you actually look at the larger picture, he lost. Hezekiah won. The Lord won. Between you and me, when I read the book of Hebrews, chapter eleven, I often wonder why are some of these people in here? I mean, there's some mystery folks in that that I don't have an answer to, and I guess it's going to be one of those conversations in heaven uh, when, when, you know, how I'll find out. 
But I also wonder if why is Hezekiah not in that place? And I don't have an answer to that either. But I do, I can affirm this. He is a great example of faith in God to follow him regardless. Never give in. Never give in. No matter how awful the situation is, never give in to that which is evil. The Churchill of Judah. Thank you very much for your attention. Hezekiah's tunnel is still open. You can still go through it. Actually, they've developed it uh, rather nicely. I mean, they haven't changed the tunnel or anything. There were a lot of things that had to open or not. But uh, the thing that is particularly neat now is you can actually go to the Siloam Tunnel. Uh, perhaps, have you been over there? My father has. Okay, when was that? In the early 90s. Okay. In the early 90s, the Siloam Pool had not been found. There was this other weird pool that it dumped into. But now you're able to go down to the real pool Siloam out of John 9. And so forth. And then there's another tunnel you can walk up and get to the western wall uh, that's part of the old drainage system that caught a bunch of Jews dying during the 78 AD rebellion. But that, that's another whole ball game. Uh, in the back first. Uh, you said that there was another pool that it went to. Is Hezekiah's tunnel kind of like a, a labyrinth? I, I hesitate to call it a labyrinth. Uh, there's, there's nowhere you can turn off and get lost in it. Okay. Uh, you basically, it's one direction. You just have to follow the direction. Uh, the reason it's serpentine like that are basically three theories to explain. One is the argument that there is a soft vein of stone through from the pool area to the spring area, and they're following this soft vein of stone because you know most people are lazy. We don't have to dig through hard rock, which I don't want to dig through any of this rock. Uh, that's one theory. Second theory is that there was a fissure in the stone and that some of the water was leaking through and they already knew that it, they, they could do this. Now, my opinion, it's purely my opinion, and most people don't agree with me here. My opinion is I, I have trouble getting my head around that because why this nice little gentle curvature on each end and then suddenly and then it smooths back out. Uh, that doesn't make sense for a fissure in the rock or a soft vein, normally the way ge geological stuff is formed. The third theory is that they dug, rather than straight toward one another, running the risk of missing each other, I'm sure like that, they do this and at least they increase their probability of intersecting somewhere. That's my opinion. Most people don't buy it, but I give you all three and why. That, that's, that's the scholarly approach. Yes? I would also think that they might have done it just to give them, it's like you couldn't invade through that way very easily. You you, have, I, I'm sorry? It would just seem like it would be harder to invade through that way because you'd get, if somebody tried to go through the water system, they'd get stuck in those. Uh, they, they're not that tight. Uh, you, you, can, you can probably defend this fairly easily because it's not very wide. Yeah. It never gets wider than where I was. Right, that's what you I'm can saying. clog it up pretty easily. That's, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Is that, that they, they did it on purpose. That the, so if, even if they had come in, they had to come in single file, and there would would have okay. the curves would have made it a little bit. Yeah. More. They I, get, would have had a little bit more time to clog it up at one end so that they could defend it. I'll have to concede that is a possibility. All right. Go ahead. Um, describe the process you go through when you find uh, archaeological evidence of some kind hear about it that doesn't at the onset appear consistent with scripture how do you all right you that's a that's a very good question uh, how many hours we got uh, as, as a believer okay were you in chapel at all this morning I didn't think about the implications of that question um, I don't approach archaeology as an apologetic to prove the Bible. Now, having said that, I, Roland DeVoe, a great Catholic archaeologist and priest, whom I never knew, he passed away before I got into all of this, but in one of his books he says, archaeology and the biblical story should mesh. I agree with that. And he argued, and he's a very respected archaeologist, he excavated Qumran 
he was the first one of the first excavators at Qumran. And he argued that if they don't go together, either we're not understanding the archaeological record correctly, maybe we don't have all the data, remember the skewed database with which we were, or we're not understanding the biblical narrative correctly, which is a possibility. I mean, none of us have an infallibility of understanding what's going on and we need to keep our minds open. So either the archaeology we don't understand correctly or don't have it all, or the biblical story we don't understand, or we don't understand either one of them properly. And I'm, you know, in which case then you're inevitably going to mess up. Um, his argument, I, I'm going to extend it. I don't know that he would have said this, but I, I would argue my default setting, using sort of a computerese kind of thing, my default setting is the Bible is true. Period. Now, it might be that I'm not understanding the Bible correctly, but the Bible is still true. Okay. If I can't figure out how exactly to take this what appears to be a contradictory element with the scriptures. I sort of put that on hold. Doesn't mean I abandon it, doesn't mean I ignore it. I'm just not sure what to do with it because there, there's so many times that the biblical narrative has been vindicated that it seems unwarranted to me to jettison this. And in, uh, alternatively, the archeological record, given enough time and usually pursuit, the database changes. The Bible is a static database. The archaeological record is in constant flux because new stuff is coming to light. And that's the way I deal with it. It may be, I know a lot of my colleagues will say you're naive and simplistic and you know, you're never gonna make it in the big league, which is true. I won't make it in the big league because of this. But uh, my faith is more precious to me than my academics. So for what it's worth. Thank you. Uh, one more. Yes, ma'am. Can you still see the Jambu site tunnel? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I didn't go through that because it didn't really connect with Hezekiah. Uh, but that's, that's great fun to deal with as well. Uh, a lot of modification and understanding of that has been made uh, as archaeological data have clarified a lot of the stuff from its earlier interpretation. So that would be a good example of the clarification with additional information. But yeah, it's still there, and they've dramatically improved, Joel, the, the approach in through that. That's the part that has really changed. Okay. Thank you very much, Dale.